Hi, this is Shambhavi. Welcome to my weekly podcast about spirituality, love, death, devotion, and waking up while living in a messy world. The Satsang with Shambhavi podcast is recorded live each week with students of our nonprofit community, Jayakula. For more information and to find out about attending a satsang, visit jayakula.org. Thanks for listening. Much love to you, wherever and however you are. So, would anyone like to suggest a topic for a talk? Hi. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> Haven't I been teaching about that for the last 12 years? <laughs> Can we narrow the field a little more? <laughs> I guess maybe in just in terms of how we just try to uphold a certain kind of identity within the modern world, I think that's kind of caught us with pride too. And then, I mean, how do we how do we how do we work on that with a with, with a healthy view? Mm-hmm. One of the things about our experience of pride is that when things are going our way, we get pleasure out of it. But the flip side of pride is humiliation or shame. So. That's not so fun. But when we feel like we're being successful at projecting the image that we want to project or accomplishing the things we want to accomplish or climbing the ladder we want to climb, we're really hooked into it by pleasure. And we also, since this is a Titan culture and runs on, it's basically fueled on pride, we get a lot of external rewards for our pride also. Pride fuels a lot of accomplishing. And we, even if we're of a certain ilk, get rewarded for being prideful. (laughs) Which is kind of interesting. We get rewarded for our image formation. Even our literal image, like on Mm -hmm. Facebook or something. The very first step in beginning to unwind that is to feel how utterly trapped we are by it. So the very first step is to notice in the midst of that pleasure (laughs) that it's got you by the throat, that you are doing things that you think you're choosing, you're actually doing them compulsively, that things you think you're making a choice about, you can't stop or are afraid to stop, that things that are giving you a lot of pleasure or entirely self-referential and uh, cause you to lose intimacy with other people. So we have to notice that the, that kind of pleasure is actually just a kind of a gloss on suffering. And we really have to feel how the ambition, the autonomy, the accomplishments, the achievements, the, accolades, the applause that we're receiving, that we are addicted to them, that they are not satisfying us and that they are actually part of the suffering that we're experiencing. So we have to actually feel that viscerally. And I I have had this experience, particularly when I was teaching at university and doing my university teacher shtick, which I've talked about quite a number of times, you know, prancing around up on the stage, being the entertaining (coughs) professor and and getting a lot of rewards for that. I mean, my first question to myself was when I noticed that I was doing that and how much pleasure it was giving me to do (coughs) that was who am I really here for? I felt slightly sheepish that I might be getting more out of this than my students. (laughs) and then I started to notice that I couldn't stop doing that I didn't know another way to be up there at the on the stage of professorship I didn't know an alternative I didn't know what to do if I weren't doing that and also people were expecting it of me I mean professors are expected to be somewhat entertainers but you're also expected to announce your smartness announce your intellectual energy in very various different ways. You're supposed to push that stuff out. You know, humility is not rewarded in academia. So 
I was doing what was expected of me, but then I realized that I couldn't stop and that the pleasure that I was experiencing was entirely egoic and self-referential and wasn't about teaching students at all. And I was already, you know, deep into my sadhana at that point. So I just stopped doing it. Like I did an experiment on myself and I didn't know what to put in this place, but I just stopped doing it. And like anything like that, it's kind of scary at first, but what happened has informed my practice and my way of being in the world ever since then, which is when I stopped doing it, I started feeling this really sweet intimacy with my students. Like they actually appeared, you know, whereas before they were just kind of beyond the fourth wall of my performance, you know? <laughs> which I think is how everybody is when we're performing stuff. Everybody else is just a, our audience. And there's no real intimacy with the audience. That was a huge lesson. So the first step is to feel that even the things that are giving you pleasure, your so-called successes at promoting a facade of some sort, even those things are actually part of your suffering. And then eventually you just become desperate to do something about it, to make a change, to do something differently. And you also must realize how fragile a position that is. You know how much I heard other professors complain about bad reviews from students? You know, they could get 900 good reviews, but if they got two bad reviews, they'd be talking about it for the next three years because they're just so fragile. Like the, the foundations of their self-image are always on the verge of crumbling. So any criticism at all, even, even warranted criticism, is perceived as a huge threat. You know, that, that house of cards edifice just keeps me needing to be built up and built up. If we get 100 likes on Facebook one day and the next day we don't get any, we have a reaction to that. That's how that's pride leaves us very fragile. Even though pride is supposed to project strength, it leaves us very, very fragile. And also uh, makes us very easy to manipulate. When you are running on the fuel of pride, you can be manipulated with praise, with admiration, with attention, and you can be destroyed by criticism. Ooh, it's not a good position to be in. I mean, just strategically, it's really <laughs> not good. <laughs> so, so in the view, then, what is, what is the best way to receive criticism? Well, it's not like that. The view is that every thing that happens, you are just being in the state of your practice and responding spontaneously. So any question of how should I behave in some certain situation or what is the one best way to respond to criticism is already out of view. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that we do sadhana and eventually become more relaxed so that we can be more spontaneous, so that we can act in a less conditioned way, right? There's no way that you can replace conditioning with a rule about how to behave. That's just more conditioning, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Everyone always asks these kind of questions. It's probably the most common question I get. What should I do if? What should I do when? What should I say when? I don't know. You're not there yet. I have no idea. Because very opposite ways of responding might be appropriate in very similar seeming situations. And you can't decide that with your mind. You have to decide that with your senses being open. It just has to come out of you naturally. That's what we're aiming toward. But in the meantime, just start to notice and try to relax a little bit. Just try to relax a little bit. And feel that happen, but we there's a lot of depth to our patterns of reactivity. There's a lot of layers. There's a lot of depth. There's a lot of complexity. Noticing the first layer is just noticing the first layer. And my experience is that even if I've had something that seems like a big karma clearing, three months later, six months later, a year later, two years later, I'm back. Noticing the next layer. Because what happens is that as we relax in our sadhana, 
our senses become more subtle. So we're able to perceive more of our how we are, how we're showing up. You all maybe notice how when you are talking to friends or anyone about another person, if there's five people talking about somebody, there's five subtleties or lack thereof of ability to see what's happening with another person. Someone says, wow, someone says really depressed. The other person says, well, I didn't notice anything. They seem really cheerful to me. <laughs> Something like that. That's because our senses are in a more or less constrained condition. And so that's the same about ourselves. <laughs> so I may notice the gross level of pride but I have to notice a whole bunch of other manifestations that are more subtle. So I have to subtleize my senses in order to notice those things. Mm -hmm.